Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Joe Moniak, D, 0, 5. Hello team, welcome back and thanks for joining us for episode 5 of Whelmed Season 4. My name is Rich and with me is my co-host Emily and producer Neil. Hey everyone, in these review episodes we'll be diving into the plots, characters, easter eggs, and everything else of Young Justice and use that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, but we'll be discussing them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. Sir, sir, you came here to die. Come back when you are ready to live. And with all that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The title of this week's episode is Tale of Two Sisters. The release date was November 4th, 2021. The in-episode dates are March 26th and April 17th through 19th. The writer was Brian Holfield, the director was Vinton Hoyk, and the voice director was, as always, Jamie Thomason. Special guest voice credits include Logan Browning as Onyx. I'm so excited. Nick Chunland as Sportsmaster. See how easy that was to say? How exciting. The <laughs> puzzle <laughs> is Cassandra Savage, Talia Al Ghul, Leon Wynn Harper, you know, everyone. She has like 10 voices. Kelly Stables as Arrowette. Uh, Tara Strong as Tara Markoff. Mae Whitman as Spoiler. And Kaoni Young as Sensei. Just in time for your next mission. This week's episode opens with a pretty good day in the life of Artemis Croc, cool aunt, literature professor, and superhero. Only for that day to end with her finding out that Connor died on Mars. Uh, (laughs) After the credits, we cut to three weeks later, where everything is awful all of the time. (laughs) And after a talk between her and Will about Artemis's grieving process, we get a flashback to Sportsmaster training a young Artemis and Jade. Uh, a memory that motivates Artemis to decide to track down Cheshire again. We then cut to Cheshire arriving on Infinity Island for, as of yet, unknown reasons. Meanwhile, Artemis heads to University Library <laughs> and is followed by an unknown masked figure. We'll talk about that. Later. This <laughs> mysterious face? figure attempts. <laughs> this mysterious figure attempts to sneak up on Artemis, but is ambushed by Arsenal and Arrowhead, and ultimately taken down by Tigris. She reveals herself to be Onyx Adams, a defector from the League of Shadows, who comes to warn the team that Cassandra Savage is on her way to claim, quote unquote, that she's defected, but that she's actually trying to become a mole on their team. And at that exact moment, Cassandra Savage walks in. Meanwhile, back on Infinity Island, Cheshire attacks Sensei, hoping to kill him and thus eliminate the contract that's been hanging over her head since she betrayed the League of Shadows years ago to save Red Arrow. During that first five-year time skip, Sensei defeats her and tells her that Infinity Island and its residents are no longer affiliated with the League of Shadows. Back in University Library, the (laughs) plot gets more convoluted as Cassandra Savage insists that she's genuinely defected from the shadows after seeing her father Vandal Savage kill her sister Olympia and accuses Onyx of being the liar. On Infinity Island, Cheshire gets into an argument about parenting with Talia al Ghul. (laughs) If that's just a funny it's sentence. It's a totally normal I, thing yeah, to happen. Yeah, that <laughs> sentence that's right super there. funny. Um, a totally normal <laughs> thing to happen. And only for it to be interrupted by her phone going off and her rushing off of the island. We see another flashback. This time of Jade running away from her home, which we first saw way back in season one during Homefront. And in the present day, the heroes attempt to transfer Onyx and Cassandra to the vault is interrupted by a League of Shadows noodle truck. A huge fight breaks out. But both Cassandra and Onyx end up escaping their restraints and saving our heroes' lives. Later, at Green Arrow's vault, Artemis interrogates both shadows, but can't decide if either of them are trustworthy. Either one or both could be telling the truth or lying, and the team has absolutely no way to know for sure. So, still thinking about how everyone, including her sister, deserves a chance at redemption, Artemis decides to keep both Cassandra and Onyx locked up until they can figure out the truth. And in yet another flashback, we see Sportsmaster finding out that Jade ran away from home and forcing Artemis to keep training, as well as Jade leaving on a bus and trying to keep it all together. And back in the present day, Jade arrives at the Wen Harper Croc household in Star City to ask why Paula called her on her emergency number 
only to find out that Leon is fine and it was actually Artemis who made the call. Superboy, are you alright? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. So let's all head over to University Library and talk about this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Is it the most important thing that happens? Uh, oh my episode? gosh. No. Are we going to keep laughing about the fact that this library is just called University I, Library? I don't know. It's, for some reason, it cracks us all up that it's not the University Library. It is It is literally called University Library. Um, where, where did you go? Uh, well, I went to university. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know why it strikes us as so funny either. It's a complete... It's fine. It's perfectly fine. It's just... I've never been to any college that it was called University Library. It was usually had some a name. <laughs> or just <laughs> or the something. library. <laughs> or the library. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to the library. Yeah. That's funny. Anyway, that's it. That's the deep, meaningful giggles that'll be happening off and on through this episode. Woo! And that's our entire uh, feeling the yeah, aster segment. Stuff. Moving aster. on. Yep. <laughs> this was exactly. This was a roller coaster from beginning to end. And it was like, even from the intro, I was like, oh, okay, let's just marinate in how great Artemis's life is right now. Because any second, okay. it's going to explode. She was doing great in all aspects. She was doing like, more than okay. She was happy. Had her mom move in with her. Doing She's happy. Great, like, that relationship what? clearly has wait, her own do you relationship. Think- Wait, doing, do you think Paula lives with them now? Oh yeah, totally. I I could be totally wrong, but that's how that's the vibe I got. <laughs> that is absolutely not the vibe I got. She is there a lot, which is why I was she is there confused. a lot. No, <laughs> re- okay. So I totally. I mean, I could be totally wrong, but I totally thought she lived there now. Like I assumed that she was there at that point because Artemis is going to university library and will is not home from work so she is babysitting leon because absolutely no one is leaving leon home alone at any point in this series i see in my thoughts yeah i guess that's that true there. no i i think i, I don't i'm know. wondering too because they both i mean artemis is out like he's working and then artemis is out she's teaching during the day she's doing all this stuff and she's superheroing at night like i feel like she might not live there but Paula's got to be there a lot. Yeah. I would think. Bow Hunter security only on point when I have a babysitter. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, amazing. <laughs> only on point when mother in law is home. I mean, when you're part of the superhero society in Young Justice, you got a never ending list of babysitters and they all have superpowers. <laughs> We've established this. Well, I mean, you'd think so, but. I don't remember, like, I don't think it's crashing the mode, but I don't remember too many other people showing up this season no, to help out with me. La- last season, we had, she, she, that's she, true. She chills at the premiere building sometimes. And heads, yeah, that's true. heads to the source wall <laughs> by accident. Yeah. The most uh-huh. well adjusted child. Homeschool field trip right up the nose of a god. The child with yeah. fine grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it's rough i mean we also do see the, the javelin real fast news travels fast the javelin travels faster what do you got emily so jumping into my actual notes instead of us just talking about all the random things in this episode that make us laugh i will say if we're talking about uh artemis's home life and what the situation is there I am forever and absolutely devastated by the fact that the her finding out that Connor is dead scene is just her walking in and asking who, because just this tells yeah. us so much. This tells us that it's like, oh, yeah, no, two members of the team never simply show up quietly at your house late at night. That's not good. It is only ever bad news. And you're like, yeah. And they all like turn and look at her and they don't say anything like they're yep. clearly sad about something and they're not like oh hi we came over to watch a movie yeah that's not what was going on yeah oh yeah and it's the fact that she says who instead of what happened or what's wrong you're like this just happens this is just this has happened before kind of feels like the vibe of that that scene oh yeah for sure heartbreaking it's very well done 
on a on a slightly lighter note, still talking about this household, uh, I would like to formally request the backstory of that Harper Wen family photo because just please and thank you, my kingdom for canon stories about that one weird year where Jade and Will lived together with Leon. <laughs> it's all I want in this world. Mm-hmm. She's like, uh, I tried to be the soccer mom. And I'm like, can I can I have a comic book miniseries about it, please? No fighting crime, just these chaos people living in a house together. Is Greg allowed to write fanfic? I don't know. <laughs> as long as he doesn't credit himself, I think it's all right. I guess. I guess. Uh, yep. Oh. So, Neil, you were talking about whether or not you think uh, Paula lives with them or is just a constant babysitter. And I want to throw out that watching this one time, I had the thing where... Artemis says, wait, mom, did you know, do you know where Jade is? And I'm like, Paula doesn't answer that question. And I'm like, she did, does, not. does she? Does, does Paula just know this stuff and not tell anyone? That is also the same conversation where she feels like getting Wally back is a more feasible <laughs> option than getting Jade back. Like, yeah, like, that response wait, is also wild to me. Yeah. Well, like, I'm like, again, Paula, what do you know that you have not told anyone else? Yeah. I think Paula's desperately underestimated. <laughs> She's still Agreed. got contacts. She was a criminal for a long time. <laughs> yep. <laughs> who knows? Who knows who she has Sunday tea with? This is what I'm saying. <laughs> Amazing. You know like, what I'm saying? Oh, yep. yeah. Because that yeah. is a little bit canon of things like the thing from the comics about how Artemis and Icicle Jr. just know each other. <laughs> and they never interact on yeah. the actual show, but they just know each other. And I'm like, amazing. I love this. I love the idea of Artemis having a weird supervillain extended family. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I want to see like the, you know, the Sunday afternoon tea where like Wotan shows up and has like tea with uh, Paula. And he's like, oh. Here is where Jade is. By the way, I had a vision. Yeah. Just, yeah, I mean, whoever, whoever evil equivalent of Dr. Fate shows up for, 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 uh, for some cucumber sandwiches. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Emily's, is, Emily's stuck. <laughs> and this stuff is why I constantly am like, I want the Wen Harper Croc household sitcom. Like, this is the reason why. <laughs> These conversations. Oh, because yeah. <laughs> oh, it would be so good. What else we got? <laughs> so, Neil, do you have any notes while I collect myself? I, I do. Let's see if I can, because I usually do mine in chronological order. It's the yes, only way so I do I. So. Okay, so, so if we want to do super random things, the very first whiteboard that we have is from Les Mis. Yes. Um, by Victor Hugo. And nice. the specific line that is on there um, is, it is your soul that I buy from you. That That's the trans, that's the translated piece. Oh, um, cool. And the, the larger one is, Jean Valjean, my brother, you no longer be- belong to evil but to good. It is your soul that I buy from you. And I'm just like, ooh. I don't know. It's a whole class. So like, we don't have to do it's a whole class at university, but I, I mean, it's just such an interesting line to, to have yes. be the only one. Yeah. Cause you know, cause that's, it's from the scene that's about Jean Valjean getting a second chance to live his life after committing a crime that should not have messed up his whole life. Uh, so absolutely. All of the literature with an asterisk has references to this arc. It is all relevant and metaphorical. Uh, and it's good. Thank you yeah, for translating that because well, I forgot. It took, a, <laughs> I forgot. It, it took a minute and I ended up on like goodreads.com and all. Of, I'll, yeah, it took a minute because even after translating it, I'm just like, oh, wait, but which part of this? But, yeah. Translation but where does that is fit? the sentence? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the other one is that she's starting to write. Well, the best of times is the worst of times in that second segment, which is from A Tale of Two Cities, which we will see throughout the entire episode. She's reading it. Uh, Paula's reading it. It's quoted at the end. It's quoted in the middle. She's reading it as we, a child. It's, we gonna get into it. I yeah. promise you. Okay, good. Perfect. <laughs> I, ha- I have my note. Yes. The English degree. It's coming in handy. <laughs> oh. um, also, I... I <laughs> 
So Jade, Jade is driving on a boat to Infinity Island. Yes. And given that Infinity Island is both a sovereign and remote island, I have to assume she went through the same boat rental place. Um, <laughs> That's the first thing I thought of, too. I was like, is that the same boat? Is it a, do like, they get a discount? Is it a family every, discount? Is it a frequency every, discount? She's got a is it the only place you can get time, one from? Ten times rental. It's actually just some guy's boat at like his house or something and he just so it's the reason it's a different color is because he had to repair it from the last time he, that he right. lo- lo- loaned it out yeah obviously right when harper i think that family needs sitcom. to put arrow boat on the side of it <laughs> right canon <laughs> is this the arrow boat no it's rental that's funny <laughs> oh god i love that uh yeah <laughs> when we're ready i have a deep dive on onyx but i don't th- i don't know if we're Oh yeah, on Onyx, I got I got some things in the next episode with Onyx too. Yeah. Anyway, what else you got? Some ra- random other notes I got before we get into a deep dive on Onyx. Again, I say everything in this episode of showing Artemis grieving is heartbreaking. Like literally, that yeah. scene of her having it all together, getting into the car, breaking down for two minutes, and then having it all together again is heartbreakingly real. Um, yep. <laughs> Also, on, and then on a lighter note, Will stabs a man in the spine with a pen, and that is absolutely wild to me. And I'm very, I feel like I had to have said this and screamed something. If I didn't, I don't care if I did or didn't. I'm saying it again. The fact that he didn't say that the pen is mightier than the board than this. makes me so angry. <laughs> <laughs> you did not I want say it. that. <laughs> I want it. <laughs> It was right there. It was right there. It was right there. And I feel like it's I feel like it could have it could have worked. It could have landed. Crispin <laughs> cuz Crispin could have done it without a doubt. That's great. Oh my gosh. That whole fight. I just love that like we've had let me think. Yep. We've had as many seasons of Will fighting in a security guard uniform as we have him fighting as a superhero. I'm just saying. It's the same. And you let me know. There's a deep dive on all of the food items. I'm, I'm, I'm Stores, I'm ready as well. <laughs> Go for it. Go for it, Neil. Go for it. Go to town, Neil. Okay. I, have a, I still have a lot of questions about chicken whizzies because they are prevalent enough that you can purchase them. Clearly, you can purchase them in a supermarket and mm-hmm. obtain them. Not only that, this is a chicken whizzies. Freeze whizzy. dried. Freeze dried chicken whizzies. Not only that, this is a 24 hour restaurant that we see next across the street from the bi- the Big Belly Burger. There are chicken waffles. <laughs> right, Mind you, not chicken and waffles. It is it distinctly says chicken waffles, which I assume is a waffle made out of chicken. So, because people waffle put anything, man. We waffle a lot. <laughs> now, then also you have the food. You have the food truck, which the ch- – cha- I think it's called cha shu, and cha shu specifically refers to the pork that is in ramen. That's why you have the image of a pig on the door. And then clearly the name is cha-cha uh, cha su, cha shu. So that, the play on words, which I hope is just a real place that they took over because I don't want it to be – that seems too elaborate. They wouldn't – I mean, right? They wouldn't make an entire fake company. Somebody in the League of Shadows has the a shadows? cousin who knows oh, how to cook, I'm... and so they have a food truck empire as a front for other things. That's the League of Shadows works. have been around forever. They've got to have fronts, but it's you still know legit. when you it's and delicious. I'm sure it is both legitimate and delicious. Yeah, and you don't front. start a food truck front unless you actually know how to cook. <laughs> you also you also have the a six, one of the only notable sixteens in here is the show you is listed at sixteen dollars. Also, and this took me until like right before we were recording because I knew it had to be a thing and I finally figured it out. But the whole fight happens at the intersection of O'Neill and Adams, which I believe Uh. is a reference to Dennis O'Neill and Neil Adams, Adams. who were most notable for their work with Green Lantern, Green Arrow and Batman, which is most of the people that we have in these episodes. Yeah, that's a very nice sketch little doubt that is there and also neil adams spells his name correctly great job neil adams 
<laughs> no, just, why? Just Forget the these same, eyes. The same way as I. Uh, yeah, get out. Get these eyes out of here. What else do I have? There's also a jewelry watches repaired store. That's it. That's just the name, which I thought is very funny. As well as the sunglass igloo. This is our first instance of seeing that. Instead of a hut, it is an igloo. <laughs> Truly amazing. I do love nice. the slightly off-brand uh, names for things in Young Justice. Forever 16. Yep. From the comics. Well, from the comics. <laughs> love that Forever yeah. 16 is where Connor shops. I know, exactly. <laughs> we could fill out such an interesting mall. Forever, <laughs> Forever 16, the sunglass igloo, chicken whizzies in the food court. Oh, and then the so cha-cha-cha-choo. Our, cha-choo. our, our <laughs> cha-cha-choo. big... Cha-choo. So our... <laughs> So you say, you know how some people make those like fan made guess who boards where you replace all the things with like characters from a specific yes. property? Somewhere in my house, there is an ancient copy of the board game Mall Madness. And I say that we make yes. a full fan mock up for all of the fake Young Justice stores. Because the, uh, obviously, the, and then you could have the, what are the kiosks be? watches jewelry repaired like that's yep. just the name for some reason i feel like I'm, I'm flashing back to uh people can go back and listen to our uh comics commentaries but when um <laughs> chris jones did the thing in the in the closet when barbara and dick were in the closet with the with the board games and he wanted to do all the board oh, games yeah. were named after ship names. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but they, they didn't let him do it. Nope. <laughs> And I just feel like I feel like this mall thing would be could be could be so many references. I'm like I'm having ideas. This is a, a ludicrous that project, awesome. and I don't have time for it. But the fact that my brain is like, <laughs> and then you could make all the pieces different members of the original team, and like you could fill out like their shopping list with like different mm. stuff that was like references to the show, and then you could be, like I have a whole thing going on, and I don't have time to make this thing. Superboy's just. <laughs> t-shirts mm-hmm. uh it's t-shirts and then dog food for wolf uh and that's it <laughs> right cargo pants amazing <laughs> that's <laughs> he it. found a look that works and he's sticking to it <laughs> why not forever 16 oh <laughs> uh, that's ridiculous neil what about onyx you have something for onyx you said? um so onyx adam so one of the things about onyx is that i think a lot of people may want to look at the newest iteration but this is definitely hearkening back to her original creation uh which was by joey cavalieri and jerome moore introduced detective comics volume one number 546 uh january of 85 and i only bring that up because jerome moore helped design i mean well technically i guess let's say redesign the look for onyx for young justice um christina soda had tweeted about that at one point um so they had the original designer nice. from the 80s come back in um and do the redesign and she showed she's shown up before like i in my brain because i've watched all of the arrowverse in my brain i'm like i think and i was right so she was in an episode very different iteration and then she was also in batman bad blood Whose director? This is uh, this is me just circling uh, in my own spin spun out version. Please follow or don't. I accept either option. Um, but <laughs> Batman: Bad Blood, which was directed by Jay Oliva, who also Oliva, directed yeah. ten episodes of season one, including the episode Failsafe, which is also our first introduction to another character that we see in this episode for the first time since then. Whoa. <laughs> and we will talk more about that in Crash in the Mode. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Or and next episode. And to more stuff with Onyx to next episode too. We got notes. <laughs> well, they got notes. So my I have two I have two more points from this one, uh, from this particular episode, uh, that are more a deep divey. So if anybody has any more fun facts we want to throw out before I Put on my English major hat. My favorite line from the entire episode is, that would only happen, well, we're like, when hell freezes over, better get your mittens, but I only need one. When Cassandra shows up with one arm. 
That's my favorite line. So seriously, too. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, and also right before that, it was basically like, what was the like cuts in between? It was we need some help working this out. Cut to Artemis. She looks at camera. Immediate cut to Jade. Then her receiving that text message was like, we don't technically know what it is until the end of the episode, but yeah. like clearly, you know, all of all of those things line up super well. Like. Either you either saw it in that moment and that's great, or you didn't see it and then you're it's confirmed what it is within the same episode. Let's go to English class. I got one more point about the episode, then we got actual English class. So I do want to say, so this is the episode where we we see uh, more of more flashbacks of the of Jade and Artemis, and uh, get to see Jade running away again. And I just want to throw out the reminder that when Jade ran away. Uh, she was 13 and Artemis was nine. And I just like reminding people of that because I also forget just how young these kids oh, yeah. are in these initial flashbacks. And gosh, it makes everything worse. Uh, <laughs> but it's important. And connected to that. I hate I just, Sportsmaster. So oh, hard. we all do. <laughs> well, yeah, but I hate him more now because like my daughter is nine. Like, you know, it's, right? I firsthand would be like, I would be doing this. To my nine-year-old daughter right now? No. Yes. Yeah. Um, Mine's also also turning. She's currently nine as well. <laughs> Neil and I are on the same page. Yeah. It's a terrible page. Um, but related to all of that, I do just want to point out that one of the scenes that I really like and like how it's executed in these flashbacks is the moment that's Jade on the bus near the end of the flashbacks. Because for me, and I think probably for a lot of other uh, female viewers, is a very humanizing moment for Jade, who is often portrayed as just awesome and ready to go and always ready to fight anything and very put together in her chaos gremlinness. But it is a scene in which Jade is a 13-year-old girl alone at night on public transportation, and the guy walks up and just stands next to her. And... Any man, no matter what he looks like, just stopping to stand next to your seat is going to feel like a threat in that situation when you are that young and that much at risk of anything bad happening to you. And even though we know that she can handle herself as a character and she is able to just make him run off without actually doing much of anything, the look on her face when she looks out the window seems just so much more vulnerable than we almost ever see Jade. And I think it's just a really good moment that gives so much emotional context to who that character is, especially when like we have seen Jade run away before and seeing that scene in like season one is very much like Jade is tough and ready to go out on her own. And she can't take Artemis with her and she's just got to fend for herself. And then we see literally like within an hour of running away, she is scared and vulnerable and is just doing her best. And it's a good scene. It's executed well. I like it. I appreciate what it does in this flashback narrative. Well, I, I would say with that scene, because I know that it's like there has been some interpretations of like, well, like what, like what's the issue with it? And one of the key things that I that I really wanted to note on this yeah. rewatch was the the bus is empty. Like the so social scenario of a full bus and that's the last seat and a person is looking at it is so, so different from this is an entirely empty bus. No matter what two people it is, the option of sitting next to the only person on the bus is socially unacceptable. Yes. And then you start to layer in all of the additional factors that, that we've already discussed. But I, I just wanted to point out on this rewatch, noting noting that, the, you know, that background element of there is no one else on this bus. Yes. Which is also part of why it is scary, both in terms of oh, go yeah. sit anywhere else, but also there is no one else there to help or stop anything uh, if something bad were to happen. Because I know some people... Outside of the driver, yeah. if the driver even knew what was going yeah, on. if the driver's paying attention. Yeah. So it's a whole thing. Always, always a reminder that in these flashbacks, Jade's 13 and Artemis is nine. D join me in my heartbreak for these two children. Yeah. Thank you for putting um, ages on that. Yep. I had to... Go back and check from old messages with uh, Ariel <laughs> about because Ariel remembers these ages. And when we first did this, I had to ask her and I had to go and check again. And I was like, yep, right. That's what it is. They're four years apart. And that's how young they are. Because I do. I think it gets lost in some of the stuff of it looks like, 
you know, you could guess Jade was anywhere in her teens in those flashbacks. Oh, yeah. And it's like, no, she is a young, young teenager. <laughs> Gosh, I feel bad for these two children and all these flashbacks. And we'll get Ooh. into that more next episode. In the next episode, because we get more. Yay. Yep. <laughs> anyway. All right, let's go to English class. English class. I'm going to put on my little English major hat uh, for two minutes. And I'm going to explain the ending of Tale of Two Cities, <laughs> which I haven't read in at least a decade, but I do remember enough of and Googled some stuff to remind myself. I have never read it, so I'm, I'm looking forward to this. I had to read it in high school. So spoilers, everyone, for a 160-plus-year-old novel, <laughs> in case you care. It's the same as The Two Towers, right? Yes. It's The Tale of Two Towers? Yes. I'm not saying It's no. all the same. So... The quote over the credits that we hear Artemis read uh, at the end of this episode, for many viewers, might know it from uh, The Dark Knight Rises because it gets read at in that at one point. But it is from the very end of A Tale of Two Cities, which is the book that is shown multiple times throughout the episode uh, and is where the title of this episode, A Tale of Two Sisters, comes from. So basically a very condensed crash course of the relevant plot details here because this book is very, very long and 12 million things happen. There are like 12 plots in this book, I feel like, as far as I remember from high school. So there's a guy named Sidney Carton who's been in love with a girl named Lucy for most of this book, but he's a disaster uh, and believes that she can't love him back. So he just dedicates his entire life to making sure that she's happy. And she eventually falls in love with a guy named Charles Darnay and everything seems all right for a little bit. But then the French Revolution happens and for reasons too complicated to explain. Lucy's husband, Charles Darnay, gets arrested and then sentenced to death. And after several failed attempts to get him released, Sidney Carton eventually just decides to switch places with Lucy's husband on the day of his execution so that Charles Darnay can escape and live out the rest of his life with Lucy. And Sidney Carton then goes to the guillotine in his place and ultimately sacrifices everything for the chance that Lucy might be happy and has this whole paragraph long internal monologue as he is walking to his death. And so, yeah, it's a whole thing about sacrificing yourself for the people you love and to all of make sure that everybody's okay. And as I said in Scream Something, I'll say it again. Uh, do not talk to me about uh, I see her, an old woman weeping on the anniversary of this day connected to Connor because I'm not okay and neither are you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want that. So that is... You can't make <laughs> That is the very condensed <laughs> crash course of the relevant plot details of A Tale of Two Cities. There are like eight other main characters that I did not mention in that. There are like 12 other big things that happen. And as I said, the French Revolution just happens in the middle of this thing. And we all just go with it. <laughs> like this is which is also part of why I laugh seeing like nine year old Artemis reading a tale of two cities where I'm <laughs> yeah. like, I had to read this in like sophomore year and it was still a slog. And you're telling me that a nine year old read this and was like, yeah, I get this. I, I understand. So that's the English degree. We're going to take it all, uh, take put put it away until next episode because I will have more things to say about all the literature references next episode. <laughs> That's what this arc is for. Emily reads classic literature and tells you how it's connected to superheroes. <laughs> Thank you for attending my English class. <laughs> Your TED talk. Do we have anything else that's not crashing the mode? I don't. I don't know if Neil does. That's it. That's all I have. All right. Stick around. Class is in session. In our Canary Debrief, we'll be discussing what we can learn about the creative process from the episodes we review. And today, we are going to be talking about diegetic music. I'm not sure if we've talked about it before. I'm really stressing if we have. It's a great conversation to have, again, because now all three of us are here. I, I, I'm i pretty sure I had never heard of oh, it until true. you mentioned it to me. And I've done most of the Canary Debriefs, so I don't think so. I don't remember. I'm looking forward to this. Perfect. 
We have the rich stamp of approval. Diegetic music it is. I mean, the long and short of it is diegetic music is music that is actively happening in the scene in which we hear it. So the characters are hearing it and we as the audience are hearing it as well. Uh, Non-diegetic music, I think the most notable piece of non-diegetic music in Young Justice is when they're in space. Um, because the dynamic music partners do a really good job about space having no sound, and they facilitate that sound with me- with the music scores that they make. Um, so I think that's probably your biggest variance is where here in the car, as Artemis is driving <laughs> to university, it's diegetic music because that track is actually playing. And once that happens, there's a lot that can happen additionally because we know that she's listening to it. So one of the, my big questions is, is that a track she's chosen to play and have that emotional response with intention? Is it a track that happened to come on and she's having that emotional response because of it? Yes. Diegetic music is so good because you can ask so many questions. That said, it is also difficult sometimes to have it work um, because it can also as much as it can add to a scene, I feel like if not done well, it can also really detract from the scene. I think part of what is great with this one is that I I feel like rem- I remember the first time watching this episode, I wasn't sure it was diegetic music until Artemis got out of the car and then realized like, oh, this is something she is hearing and crying to, which is made more tragic in many ways by small crashing the mode. Uh, when we realize in the next episode that this is the same song that has been synced up to the like Superboy fan memorial video that is circulating online that we find out exists in the next episode. And whether Artemis put it on herself or heard it on the radio, as you said, are both different, equally tragic things to have happened and are heartbreaking to see. Given the timeline, it could have been a track that had already been chosen for that, and then she's hearing it in the car. Yeah. Well, it's yeah, that's tough. I mean, there are also a lot of fun versions of it. Don't like we right before this, we we were talking through the really fun, somewhat almost campy versions uh, from the '90s and early 2000s. Is that often those shows would showcase bands by having them there live playing in front of the characters in the shows namely buffy and smallville were our two touch points um which is a lot of fun Uh, it is weird sometimes (laughs) because then you have these musical guests who you know you recognize and they're just standing next to 30 year old tom welling just in a coffee shop being a high school student (laughs) but yeah i think it's i like i said i think it's done really really well here and this version of it is done in a way that lets you as an audience member ask a lot of additional questions because of it. That's awesome. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that. We're all feeling the mode. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in season four. In Crash in the Mode, we'll be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that might affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on wild flights of fancy. Let's do it. Crash in the mode. As I said in in uh, the Canary Debrief, the sad car song is also the sad Superboy tribute video song because I'm fine and so are you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's my little Crash in the Mode. This is the one me. that Beast Boy in the next episode is just playing on repeat. Yeah, yeah, because... Uh, because again, Beast Boy is Beast Boy's fine. There's nothing wrong. Uh dude. Everything's wrong. Beast Boy <laughs> Beast Boy is having the time. Boy Beast Boy is having a time. Halo is a mother box. These things are true <laughs> every episode. That's right. Sorry, I forgot to say that. Maya Ava Anna and War World. What's up? <laughs> War World. You got War World. I can say it now. <laughs> Ah, oh, yes, and everyone yeah. trips. Yeah, I did get War World, and I didn't Ma'ayava get the other one. Anna. No, War World. <laughs> the greatest what argument. Are, what are they doing? <laughs> Ma'ayavana. War World. Someone explain to me why one of those is so much easier for me to say. Yeah, I yeah. have no idea. Uh, the it's, other one. Yeah. No, go ahead, Rich. Say words. 
No, no, no. I was just going to say, I mean, I was, I was just going to say, I think what we said that whole freaking season, it world war, my brain wants to do world war two, world war two, world war two, not war world. And so all the vowels decide to trade partners every time we try to say it. Bloopers. <laughs> um, so that's my, yeah. my tiny uh, crash in the mode. And then the other one, the much more major one, is that uh, Cassandra is the liar and the mole. But we won't know that until the end of this arc. It is wild. I, I mentioned this. I think I, I mentioned this in the next one. But like. They're both so believable. I, it was so hard. I spent an unreasonable amount of time on a single, like, two seconds of this episode to see if I thought I saw what I... I don't think I did. But in the car, when Arrowette falls onto... Cass- are we saying Cassandra? Because that's the other piece here. It's Cassandra. Cassandra. Cassandra Savage, and then Cassandra. Yes. So, dear listener, when you watch the next episode, pay attention to how they say Cassandra or Cassandra. It's important. Um, but when Arrowet falls onto Cassandra, I was really trying to see if I could see her push her, not with the part of the arm that we can see. Oh. Oh, because is- when it happens quickly, it really looks like she's pushing her without touching her. When I slowed it down, I didn't feel quite the same way, but I also feel like I watched it too much in too many different varying <laughs> speeds. So I kind of lost all sense of reality. But there was a moment where I was trying to see if they had like layered that in because no one else would have seen it except us, the watcher. Yeah. To see if she pushed her without. um so remind me, is it the same glamour charm they were using on Artemis? Theoretically. I mean, it's the Basically. same setup. Yeah. Obviously, someone else did that charm. You know, Zatanna didn't. But As far as we know. No, of course. But like, because Raish is the one who, back in the day, he looked at what was around Artemis's neck and was like, mm-hmm. Oh, excuse me, and then took it off her neck. Like he recognized it in a way, like it's just it's not an uncommon thing to have. Yeah. Or like the shadows used it a lot. But I'm also like, I keep thinking, like, gosh, she run into any what who on the team is Matt? Is Tracy 13 around? She probably wouldn't sense it. Like, I'm trying to figure out like why wouldn't somebody on the team have sensed it? Or done something i'm curious to know more satana is busy (laughs) satana's got her whole she's got a bus to deal with yeah and i would say honestly at that point she's just that good at lying because one of the things that tips it tips the hand in artemis's is when simon gets into her head and says oh hey not cool she's also not technically trying to be someone else she's just trying to be a different version of her and then it's just lying about everything yeah yeah it's i'm i was impressed but yeah no it is interesting because i did think that in one of these episodes thing of like huh absolutely no one must have touched cassandra savage to notice that you know what i mean but i think that also kind of plays on the idea that like cassandra savage is so confident that no one will want to approach her that like it doesn't come up as an issue nobody's trying to give cassandra a hug uh, so we are not running into this problem of going, huh, why do you have uh, two arms, but one of them is invisible? Mm-hmm. Which we know that's how it works from Fred Bug. Because he was picking up oh, the, yeah, sa- he was, the sandwich with the wrong hands. Eating. That's right. And Violet oh. was like, no, no, no. Top hands only. Yep. Yes, I remember that. Oh my gosh, that's a good catch. I forgot about that scene. But at the same time, you also have the presentation of I'm walking in. The first line I say is, you know, grab the mittens, but I only need one. When she gets out of the car, she intentionally chops with the right hand. I mean, she's selling it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> are we back to who's the mole? I just realized. Who's yes. The mole. Yes, oh, yeah. we are. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I just. Why did I only just. There's a, isn't there a joke in this episode from uh, Will or Roy of being like, really? Uh-huh. Again? 
Uh, well, well, you were the mole, or are we talking about Tara, or are we talking about? He's like, no, I was talking about two minutes ago when you said you were doing this, and now you're saying she's doing it. Was that in this episode mm-hmm. when they're interview when they're um, asking Onyx, and then he's like, well, no, you just said this two minutes ago about Cassandra or Cassandra. Oh my god, why did I? I chaos. I feel like I'm more, but I feel like ridiculous. I did not remember that. Well, this is, is this also when they're in there and they're interviewing and it's like the weird, um, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree or maybe yes. it stays on there and it rots and where you move the branch is where the twig grows. <laughs> right. And it's like, oh, I remember now. A bunch of mixed stop. metaphors. Yeah. Also, I'll crash it is the a mode. pile of metaphors. Sun, sunglass igloo is where um, Gabrielle Dow's mother starts working when she moves to Happy Harbor. Oh, really? Yes. That's... Yep. Episode now, fourteen. Yeah. We'll find out. That's fair. Ooh, crashed chicken. <laughs> That's a pretty big crash. Uh, and with uh, with that, I think we can Zeta out of the Watchtower. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on our website crashingthemode.com, and you can even email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And if you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S., as we have to look a little bit harder to find those. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews. And remember, what? stay, stay well, well, everybody. everybody. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours, under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.